Dr. Sylvester, who is going to give us uh, information about knowing your numbers, general medical problems. She's a graduate of Harvard University College of Medicine, trained at St. Luke's Roosevelt in Manhattan, and um, completed her, upon completion, she worked as a hospitalist at uh, New York University and transitioned to outpatient internal and internal medicine. She's been at Northwell Health since 2016, and her interests are preventative medicine and women's health. So I present to you, Dr. Sylvester. Good evening. Thank you for having me. It's been a really informative um, afternoon so far. I hope I can add to that. I'm going to share my screen. So I wanted to talk a bit about um, just some health issues and general medical health issues that affect the Black community, you know, very prevalent in the Black community. So I want to spend a lot of time talking about cardiovascular disease and the risk factors that um, impact cardiovascular disease. So as we all probably aware, so cardiovascular disease, we, when we're talking about coronary artery disease, heart attacks, traditionally we tend to think of this as a man's disease, which is not really the case. Women die of heart disease at a similar rate to men. Um, and it is the leading cause of death in African-American women. Mm -hmm. You know, in back 2018, African-Americans were 30% more likely to die from heart disease than um, the non-Hispanic whites. And, you know, those are sobering statistics that we need to think about and share with our patients. Symptoms of heart disease, of course, classically, there's chest pain or angina. But for women, we do need to think about more atypical symptoms, whether it's pain in the jaw, neck, or throat, even pain in the upper abdomen or back. You know, often people will think that it's reflux or heartburn, but it could, in fact, be a symptom of heart disease. And, and more vague complaints like feeling nauseous, vomiting, or fatigue. I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about the risk factors for heart disease, because I think each of these risk factors plays an important role in our population and our patients need to understand their, their numbers, you know, what their risk factors are, their family history and all of these things. So I'm gonna talk about hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, smoking, obesity. And as, We've heard of a number of times already, and I think we're going to hear much more about it in the speaker after me. Lifestyle risk factors are a major impact. Many of us are, have a high level or a low level of activity, I should say, um, an unhealthy diet, smoking. And these are all you know, adjustable and avoidable risk factors that we can do something about. So African-American women are 60% more likely to have high blood pressure compared to non-Hispanic whites. And al almost half of adults in the United States have high blood pressure. And only 25% have it controlled. It definitely increases your risk of heart disease and stroke. And the thing that I like to tell patients is that there are no symptoms. Patients always say, oh, I'm fine. I don't feel anything but they need to understand that they wouldn't feel anything until there's a major problem that has to be dealt with. And so we need to reduce the risk factors for hypertension and treat it if, um, if need be. These are some definitions of hypertension. There's the 2003 guidelines from the Joint National Committee. And then more recent, there's the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association 2017 guidelines you'll see that the newer guidelines are stricter um, with normal blood pressure being the same, less than 120 over 80. And then high blood pressure being 130 over 80, being greater than 130 over 80 rather than 140 over 80. And it's broken down into the two stages. I think these numbers are important for patients to understand because many people feel very comfortable saying, oh, well, I'm at 140, you know, as, as if that is then normal blood pressure. All of the risk factors I'm gonna say from each topic are 
essentially all the same. Lack of activity, diabetes, obesity, smoking, you know, all things that we can try to modify. And then prevention is incredibly important. We need to encourage regular exercise, at least 150 minutes of exercise weekly. So 30 minutes, five times a week, avoiding smoking at all costs and having a healthy, a healthy diet. I do encourage patients to monitor their blood pressure at home. Um, I always tell them they should take their blood pressure better than we do it in the office because you know we rush people in, their hands are high in the air. I tell them to sit in the chair, make sure their back is supported, sit for a few minutes before taking the blood pressure. Place both feet flat on the ground with your feet on cross and have your arm on the table at chest height. And essentially just relax, don't talk and, and uh, get it done. And most, many people will then see that their blood pressure is either better at home than it is in the office, or it is in fact high and they didn't really realize it. Diabetes. Uh, this is the thing for me that I think is the worst general medical condition, um, just because it impacts every part of your, of your body. As we all know, there's type one versus type two, but I'm focusing on type two today because that's the one that's impacted from obesity, type one being more autoimmune. Um, it is in the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States, with 37 million people in the US having diabetes and 96 million people having uh, borderline diabetes. And 80% of those people don't know it. And I feel like those are sobering statistics. Um, yeah, I find that people feel that diabetes, you know, they can take medicine and, and they'll be fine, but not really understanding the impact that it has on every part of their body. Um, you know, African Americans are 60% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes than others, and twice as likely to die of it. To diagnose diabetes, there are different um, modalities. There's the A1C, there's fasting blood sugar, the random blood sugar. I try to teach my patients what these numbers mean. So I explain to them that hemoglobin A1C is a measure of your blood sugar over three months, over two to three months. Um, and it's a percentage of your red blood cells that have um, sugar attached to them. It's normal to have sugar attached to your blood, red blood cells, but how much you have is, is the question. So a normal A1C being under 5.7, a borderline being 5.7, 6.4, and, and diabetes being diagnosed at 6.5 and higher. And we can usually, um, explain to patients that these numbers uh, equate to an average blood sugar. So an A1C of seven means your average blood sugar is about 150. An eight is your average blood sugar is about 180. And nine, it's about 210. And 10, I believe it's close to about 280. Um, there's also the fasting blood sugar that you can use in patients. So 99 or lower is gonna be normal and 100 to 125 is gonna be pre-diabetes and over 126 is is diabetes. And then if you ever check a random blood sugar and it's too above 200, that's diabetes. There's also like an oral glucose tolerance test, but that is used more in pregnancy. Prevention. I typically go on a long thing with patients about diet and I always tell them they should never eat white carbs. So I tell them no white bread, no white um, pastas, no white rice. You know, they should have whole grains, they should have lean proteins, non-starchy vegetables, water, some fruit. And then the impact of exercise is measurable and, you know, losing weight is the, the, at the center of prevention of all of these diseases. I do believe diabetics should be in their doctor's office every three months and should have their A1C checked and if they're checking finger sticks, check their logs, adjust their medicines. And then if you're a borderline diabetic, it's a conversation that you and your doctor should have together. You know, whether you're coming in, you're doing it just at your yearly physical, if you're coming back, you know, at the six month mark, um, just to keep a check on where, on where you are. High cholesterol is another 
uh, chronic disorder that impacts the cardiovascular disease. Um, and two in five adults do have high cholesterol. And obviously all the same risk factors for high cholesterol, but including of course diabetes, obesity, then there's a family history risk factor, age, so the older you are, sex more prevalent in males, but it's still there. Um, what your diet consists of, do you exercise, do you smoke? Patients should really understand their lipid panel and what these numbers mean. It, in, instead of just knowing, well, my total cholesterol is 190 or 200, they should see what is the LDL or the bad cholesterol? What's my HDL and good cholesterol? You know, where am I, what are my triglycerides? Um, the LDL, of course, high levels can result in plaque buildup. Um, and those come from animal fats and, you know, fried foods, um, whole milk products. Your good cholesterol, these are the ones that lower your risk of heart disease by basically carrying away the bad cholesterol to the liver to get rid of it. And those you'll see, avocados, olive oil, increased exercise, that, that helps your HDL. And triglycerides, I always say it's the fat in the blood. It's higher with more carbs, processed foods, lack of exercise, everything is exercise. <laughs> And then prevention is, is it's tied to your diet, right? Diet and exercise. So same foods I just mentioned, avoiding uh, foods high in saturated fats, such as fatty meats, full fat dairy, fried foods. Eat low saturated fat foods, such as low fat dairy, lean proteins, seafood, whole grains, fruits and vegetables. And then eat naturally high fiber foods, such as oatmeal. And avoid it, you know, avoid processed foods and then eat the good unsaturated fats such as avocados. So smoking, I mean smoking directly damages blood vessels, right? It it causes them to thicken and narrow and increases the risk of high blood pressure and, and cardiovascular disease. Um it is a leading cause of preventable diseases in the, the US. It's an addiction and so people can't just stop, but we have to encourage them at all costs. Um, you'll see 12 and a half percent of adults smoked it. That was in 2020. And given the pandemic, it's maybe higher just with the stress levels and the anxiety that people have uh, lived through. Um, it could be lower because of the cost of cigarettes. So. Um, we see 14% uh, of men smoke, 11% of women smoke, and even people who smoke less than five cigarettes a day can have early cardiovascular disease. So patients always talk about they only smoke socially or they're a light smoker or they never smoke in the house, but they don't realize that the two or three cigarettes that they have every day have an impact on, on their long-term health. Never starting is best. That's, you know, that is the, the way, but obviously people do. Um, but there are options out there to help stop smoking. Um, the patch, the gum, the lozenges for nicotine replacement, Chantix and Bupropion, I, I believe that they, that they work well, particularly in combination. Bupropion and the gum work wonderfully. I think Chantix works well, um, but patients have to be motivated. And it's something that you have to discuss that every visit so that they can hopefully one day make the decision to stop. Um, but I think bringing it up and mentioning these, these options to them each time, hopefully one time they will decide to try. I always say it's the best thing that they can do for themselves. And obesity. These statistics, I think, are really just very staggering. I mean, African-American women have the highest rate of obesity in the U.S., which we know, we see it. Um, there's so many factors that play a part, whether it's access to decent food, socioeconomic factors, cultural factors, 
um, <laughs> for women, something as simple as hair and not exercising. Um, they, it, we have such a high rate of obesity. Um, four out of five African-American women are overweight or obese. And when you're overweight, you're more likely to have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, all the things we've talked about and increasing your risk for cardiovascular disease. Body mass index. So this is a screening tool. I don't believe it to be perfect. I don't think that it works well for every person, but it's a screening tool. Um, and you know, the, the formula is the weight in kilograms over the square of the height in meters. Most of us just use a calculator. Um, I think that it is important when people definitely get into the range of obesity, but you'll see here normal BMI is under 18.5, I'm sorry, underweight, normal between 18 to 25, overweight 25 to 30 and obesity higher. And then there are different classes of obesity. You'll see class three with a BMI of 40 or higher is um, what we consider morbid obesity. I don't, um, like I said, I don't think it's it, these numbers work well in every patient, but I do think that it's important for patients to still see where they fall so that they understand it, that they need to adjust their risk and adjust their lifestyles. The causes of obesity are clear, how we eat, whether we're eating a lot of fast food or eating late or not eating enough or large portions or drinking sugar and eating sugar and sodas, just all of the things that um, are very easy for us to do. Most of the time, I think easy food is the food that causes uh, most of us to, to gain weight. Um, to be healthy requires a lot of planning of your meals. Um, lack of physical activity, of course, and lack of sleep. <laughs> So really the take home here for me is that we should know our numbers. We should understand what these numbers mean. Um, I think it's really important for everyone to get an annual physical. Um, as Dr. Lubin said, mo a lot of women only see the gynecologist, which is fine. And I think I did that for many years, um, but I think we should get to a point where you do see your primary care doctor and have these things checked annually to see what your blood pressure is. You know, check your fasting blood sugar to see if you have diabetes. Check your fasting um, lipid panel, understand your cholesterol. Talk to your doctor about your family history of all of these things. Um, stop smoking, which, you know, is a must. Talk to your patients about healthy food choices and exercise. And all of those things help to, to lower the risk. Um, and I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much. A lot of information to unpack. It definitely is important for us to know our numbers. And I will say while we add, you know, uh, blood sugar and high blood pressure, uh, all those things. We also want to know what your kidney function is doing. You want to know whether you are at risk and, because that's also a silent disease.